Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. So let, let's start inshallah. Let's... Okay, so just to recap what we've done so far is, <coughs> okay, so we've been going through the sources of Sharia. So in session one, we went, we went through the four sources of Sharia, um, the Quran, the Sunnah, the Ijma, and Qiyas. So then we had where we discussed a bit of the Quran, a bit debates around the Quran, how many verses are to do with ahkam, um, laws, and then we said that you know the Quran even then there's many words that can have multiple interpretations. One word can have more than one meaning. One word can be ambiguous, so hence it's up, it's open to interpretation. Then there's um, Nasikh and Mansukh, which is some verses are abrogated, some verses abrogate the others. So hence, whichever you think is abrogated or abrogator, then there'll be different opinion regarding that. Okay, then we said the objectives of the Sharia. We went into the, what does the Sharia try and preserve? And one very important thing is the... Then we went into some some rulings in Islam are qatari, which means that they're definitive, and there is no room or scope for ijtihad or difference of opinion in those. And majority of the rulings are what you call dhanni, which is speculative. So there are there are room for difference of opinions um, in that. So there can there is room for ijtihad. And yes, nice PowerPoint. By the way, does anyone know which city this is? this picture why do i have this random picture up anyone know which city this is anyone no one anyone to guess on the chat mm. any other guesses by the feel free to speak in the chat i generally don't like just speaking all the time i like to ask questions no, it's not Medina, no. This is, this is actually Baghdad. So when Baghdad was built, which was much later, the Abbasids in Abbasid. So first, after Ali radiallahu anhu, this, the, um, so he was the end of the Khilafah Rashida, the rightly guided caliphs. And then after that, the Umayyads ruled for about 93 years or so. After that, the Abbasids took over. And they built an entirely new city called Baghdad which was the city, and they made it into a zero shape. And that zero shape, comes from, it's a Sufi concept that we are nothing. So they designed in a circle, the entire city. So this was the capital center of the Baghdad. Um, Baghdad was the capital center of, of the Abbasid empire. So the Abbasids. So this is Baghdad, by the way. Okay, and the reason why there's a picture of Baghdad here is because generally at this era, that's when the Madahib were being formed. Imam Mahdi ibn Hanbal was from Baghdad in Iraq. Baghdad's in Iraq, by the way. So Imam Mahdi ibn Hanbal was from, yeah, yeah, Baghdad. But anyway, so we went through these very important concepts. If anyone hasn't um, gone through or wasn't here or hasn't gone through the recordings of those, please do go through them. There's very important concepts. Okay, and then we went through is let me just get the next slide up. Okay, and then we went through fiqh in the prophetic era. So went through that there was ijti, the Prophet himself did, did ijtihad. And then the Sahaba, when they were away from the Prophet they did ijtihad. And many, many times they ended up with two different conclusions and the Prophet did not rebuke any one of them. So both... So the Prophet some encouraged ijtihad in his time. So this is what we went through last session. So the Prophet even said that if a person tries to come up with this, not sure about the ruling and tries to come up with a ruling, then he gets, if he's right, he gets two rewards. And if he's wrong, he gets one reward. And we learned that the Sahaba, they knew the hierarchy of ijtihad. First you go to the Quran, they go to the Sunnah, then you consult others, then you uh, go to your own opinion. And then we said that, why are there so many differences in the hadith then? Because many people, they have this question. So some, so Sahaba, they when they narrate, 
they would narrate it according to their own perception of things. So some Sahaba would, wouldn't narrate what they heard from the Prophet word for word, but they would narrate it according to how they understood it. And depending on the understanding of the Sahabi, the Sahabi would narrate it accordingly. So that's why there could be, it could create differences. Sometimes the Prophet would say something which is general, Sahabi would take it, understand it as something which is specific. Sometimes the Prophet would say something specific, but others would understand it as a general rule. And sometimes we said we said that when the prophet did something, some companions thought this is part of the Sharia, and other companions thought no, this is not a part of Sharia. He's just doing it out of habit. So, so we went through in detail these issues here, and then we went to also discuss apparently contradiction, uh, contradictory texts. So let's say one hadith opposes another hadith, or one apparent contradiction because in reality um, there is no contradiction from the perception of Allah. It's just that we don't know how it's the understanding of it that's why it's an apparent contradiction so then that will create different opinions and lastly so yeah and so this is what this is where we left off at last session so just to understand the background of fiqh, why there's so many why there's different opinions and even in from the time of the sahaba radiallahu anhum and the time of the prophet so from the time of the sahaba these opinions they started and they they came out and as we went further away from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam new more and more newer newer issues they started coming so there were more ijtihad needed more people doing ijtihad more new scenarios that the the ulama had to deal with that weren't deal dealt with previously so hence they had to do new ijtihad and whenever there's new ijtihad there'll be more different opinions so this kept an and obvious and we haven't mentioned it yet i probably want to go through it today maybe uh, another session is then the people came later on started fabricating hadiths they started Many due to many first reason and the main reason was political reasons. So let's say the Rafida came, they were probably the first to fabricate hadiths. The Rafidas who supported the Khilaf of Ali and the fam and that the Khilaf should stay within Ali's family. So they started fabricating hadiths in support of Ali's family and things like that. And you had other groups, let's say, um, so then, then people started fabricating hadiths for you know whatever agendas that people had. So then the um, era, or era of codific codification of hadith came where people they started now you need to see okay where are you getting this hadith from is it fabricated did someone make it up so then that's what you call the era of codification and the uh, subject of jarh wa ta'adil so then started seeing hey where did you get this hadith from okay who did he narrate it from who did he narrate it from going all the way back to the prophet Islam. then you analyze every single person in that chain was he was he was he known to have good memory was he a liar was he an innovator um, did he have other motives and and so on so this is the science of jarh wa ta'adil so you analyze the narrators of the hadiths so that came later we'll have a proper discussion on it another time so this time what we're going to do we're not going to go into i'm going to change it slightly so today we're going to look and look into fiqh from a historical aspect a bit more so okay so let's see and by the way i'm going to ask some questions so please feel free so everyone should be near the keyboards or you can unmute and speak as well so I'm going to ask a few questions. I just, I just want to see how much um, the, those who are attending know. And by the way, I'm just a student of knowledge, by the way. This is just my own personal notes I'm presenting to you. It's not that I'm some alim or mufti or something, I'm someone next level. I'm just a student of knowledge. and I'm just presenting my research and my findings and my notes too, so that others can benefit as well. This is the whole purpose of the session. Okay, so let's start. Let me bring up the first. Okay. So which year did the Prophet pass away? Feel free to message in the chat. So which year did the Prophet pass away? Anyone aware? No one? Okay. And by the way, if anyone wants to unmute as well, you can unmute and speak. Okay. And if you're not sure, you can just write not sure. Because sometimes it feels good to know that I am talking to people. Because you know when you're teaching online, it's, it seems like I'm just talking to myself half the time, which isn't good. Yeah. Okay. So the Prophet Sassam passed away in 11 AH. So the 11th year. So the Prophet Sassam became a prophet at the age of 40. And he stayed in Mecca for about 13 years until he was 53. And so he stayed about 10 and a half years or so in Medina. So his journey is divided in, um, in about 13 years in Makkah as a prophet 
and about 11 years in Medina as a prophet. So we should, everyone should make notes of these dates. We should have an overall blueprint of the seerah in mind and rough estimations of these sorts of things. So the Prophet passed away in the 11th year after Hijrah. So then, and we mentioned the era of the Prophet that he encouraged the people as Sahab to Ijtihad, they had different opinions and so on. So we went through, we've done the era of the uh, Prophet And then we briefly mentioned the era of the Sahab and the differences that arose within their era. So we're going to look into a bit of a historical aspect a bit more now. Okay, so then after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they, the first thing that the Sahaba differed over is who should be Khalifa. So I'm not going to go through a story, it's a famous story, you can read it up, you can check it somewhere. You know, so they, the Muhajir and Ansar, they gathered and had disputes and one said, okay, we'll have a, a Khalifa, from, one from the people of Makkah, one from the Ansar. And then, you know, the people electing, appointing different people and then they concluded that Abu Bakr al should be Khalifa. So this is the first thing that after the demise of the Prophet ﷺ, they differed over. And then they differed over the inheritance of the Prophet ﷺ, and Fatima Radilan became very upset with that. And what should, how should that be um, distributed? And also where should the Prophet ﷺ be buried? That was another difference. So many of these sort of differences, they started coming out. So then, so there should be an easy, easier question now. So who became the Khalifa after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Anyone in the chat? Okay, good. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is closest companion, and he was the first man to be a believer in the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he became the Khalifa. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so we're going to look at the Sahaba and what happened in their lives. So this is just a quick overview, just a quick overview before we get. So we need to know about the Sahaba before we know the generations after them. So these are just some of my notes while I was going through this. I just, and th I done this a long time ago. I just made a few notes while I was looking into this. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he passed away in 13 AH. So that means his Khilafah ran for, but everyone should be making a timeline, yeah? So the Prophet passed away 11 AH. Now you draw a bit to the right and you draw another line, which is 13 AH. I may, I may ask you about when they, uh, how long the Khilafah and things was. So the Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu ruled for two years, three months, and ten days. Just remember two years and three months. So that's how long he ruled for. And his khilafa was cru uh, crucial. So his khilafa was absolutely crucial. Because when Abu Bakr, um, so when the Prophet passed away, Islam had spread. It wasn't just in Mecca and Medina. Islam had spread to, let's say, he had spread to Oman. He had spread to Bahrain. He had spread, you know, up north. So he's still in the Arabian pen Peninsula, but he had spread to other, other places as well. So he had reached quite far. So now when the, when the Prophet passed away, in the Khilaf of Abu Bakr, there were two issues. One is that there was a group who refused to give zakat. And again, this caused controversy. So Abu Bakr radiallahu opinion that they should be fought. Umar radiallahu anhu, he said he cited the hadith and said, no, they shouldn't be fought. They, you know, they've said la ilaha illallah. But Umar Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said that they need to be fought. So his his so that was the one thing that he was dealing with was uh, people who um, refused to give zakat. So Abu Bakr radiallahu actually waged, waged a war against them because today, straight after the demise of the Prophet Islam, they're compromising on zakat, which is one of the five pillars of Islam. Tomorrow is going to be salah. The day after that is going to be something else. And that's it, deen is wiped out. So we cannot have that in the earliest period of Islam. So he took that matter very seriously. And then there was a matter of apostasy and false prophets. So some had abandoned Islam completely. And then the others who chose to, who, I don't know, thought they were prophets. And so many false prophets came out. So he's de dealing with them as well. So he was sending battles after armies after armies to fight, the, um, to go fight all these different groups. So that's what, what he was dealing with. And then after they were dealt with, then he focused on expansion, which is armies towards Iraq. So he started expanding the Muslim territory towards Iraq. We're not going to go through any of this in detail. If anyone wants these notes, feel free to ask me and I'll share these notes with you. And uh, before the, Abu Bakr then passed away, he sent out the first army towards um, Syria, towards the Romans, so in the Sham area. And before they returned victorious, Abu Bakr actually passed away. So many important battles took place. But generally, this was the era of consolidation, where those who had, um, so the Islamic empire was basically consolidated through Abu Bakr. That's why the ulama that came later, they said, if two people were not alive, we would not have deen today like it is. First one is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, second one is Ahmad ibn Hanbal. 
And it, after a year into his khilaf, he actually compiled the Quran as well. So when the many of the Sahaba were dying in the Battle of Yarmouk with the Persians, so many of the Hufad of the Quran were dying and they were passing away. Um, so it was suggested that you know we should we need to compile the Quran. I'm just going through this very very briefly, by the way. So he actually compiled the Quran, although it wasn't in a book. It just scrolls, um, just gathered all in one. It's like a heap of pages and maybe written on leaves and animal skin. They just put it all together in one place. And then Abu Bakr passed away. Um, so now while he passed away, the Muslims actually in, in war with the Persians empire, which is next door. And they were at war simultaneously with the Romans as well, who were the two greatest empires at the time, the most powerful empire that existed at the time. So imagine such a small nation and who have you know, only been around for 23 years now at war with the greatest superpowers of their time. So this is why um, when Abu Bakr passed away, he quickly nominated Umar um, before, while he was still alive, that he will be the next Khalifa. And everyone generally agreed to this because they understood who Umar was. Because if he did, if, let's say if he passed away and he did not nominate the Khalifa, and it took, let's say, months or even weeks or months to elect someone, what's going to happen? These superpowers will attack. And if the Muslims are unified, then there's going to be a big problem. So that's why he, before he passed away, he nominated Umar radiallahu anhu. Okay, so that's Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. By the way, if anyone has any questions, feel free to use the chat or you can even unmute and ask. So I'm just going through this very quickly. So in the time of Umar, there hasn't been much expansion. Now the great, the main expansion is in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. So I was going to ask who's the next Khalifa, but it's Umar radiallahu anhu. Anyone know how many years Umar radiallahu anhu's Khilafah was? Any guesses before? Or Anyone know before we continue? Okay, mashallah, yes. Uh, 10 years. So Umar uh, uh, his Khilafah lasted 10 years. So he accepted the Islam in the sixth year of prophethood. So a bit later than Abu Bakr al but again, he was from the one of the greatest of the companions. And so he took over in 13 AH. So as soon as Abu Bakr passed away, he died. He passed away from fever. Then we had Abu Bakr, um, Umar Radiyan taken over. And he passed away 23 AH. So which means his Khilafah was 10 years. So your dates are there. Okay. So now his, his Khilafah was the era of expansion. And that's what he was focused on. So then there was constant battle after battle with the Persian Empire until generally the Persian Empire came to an end in it. There, there were some fractions of them. There were some fractions of them scattered about, but generally the Persian Empire lost all their power um, in this era. And all that territory generally started becoming to the Muslims. So these are battles after battles that took place. Qadisi is one of the main battles. Every Muslim should know about this. Then you had Battle of the Bridge before that when the Muslims lost. Qadisiyya, a conquest of Madain. This is when the capital of the Persian Empire was uh, conquered. And this is the, the famous hadith of Surah, I believe it was Surah ibn Malik. And then when the Prophet told him, this was, this was back in the days when the Muslims were poor, they didn't have anything. The, they didn't have, you know, every, they were just starting out. And this was a time where the Muslims were starving as well. They were going through poverty. They had nothing. And the Prophet calls over a companion and says to him, I see, you wearing the per I see you wearing the bangles of the Persian emperors of Khusru. And everyone was shocked. Like, what do you mean? Like, we don't have anything right now. We barely have, we don't have food for the next meal. And you're telling me that. You now, imagine what the companions would have been thinking when they heard that. And then they conquer the palace of the Persians. Finally, within 13 years of the Prophet passing away, imagine this, 13 years of the Prophet passing away. And then they, the Sahaba, they enter, they're seeing all this jewelry and gold. They've never seen, these are desert, be, desert Bedouins who've never seen any of this stuff in their lives. And they're seeing all this gold and jewelry everywhere. And they bring it back to the, uh, in Medina. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he calls her, where's that companion that the Prophet uh, told him that he, you know, he sees him that he's wearing the jewelry of the Persians. And he brought him here and he's, you know, imagine this poor person who never, you know, had wealth in his life. He's wearing these uh, jewelry of the Persian em emperor or Khusru, whatever you call him, and he's walking around the streets showing everyone. But anyway, so this is, so then what happened was in his time, so now we, we want to get to this, is these are the conquests that took place, whoever wants to read, you can read it afterwards, is then the map, basically, um, then this is the period where Ka the Kufa was built. So Kufa did not exist prior to this. 
So the policy of Umar was whenever they would conquer a place, Umar would not let the Muslims live there because he did not want the Muslims living with the non-Muslims like in such an intimate way where there's the Muslims could compromise in their religion and they'd become weaker and weaker. So he would always make them stay outside of the city. So because of this, so when they conquered Iraq, now the Persian Empire belongs to them. So then he did not want the Muslims to move in. So that's why they created a new city. And you know, Sa'ad, ibn, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas was sent there. And then eventually Abu Musa al-Ashari ended up, uh, became the governor there. So Kufa was built. And which of the four Imams comes from Kufa? Let's see who knows from the chat. Imam Abu Hanifa, mashallah. Good. Okay. And then we have the Battle of Nahawan. These are very important battles, but our purpose isn't to study history. Uh, that's why I'm just skipping through. But if anyone wants to read over these notes, feel free afterwards. Okay. And then the, he also, Omar Adan turned his attention to the Roman Empire. So then these started Arab lands. He started conquering the Arab lands. So generally about half of the Roman Empire was taken in the, uh, in the period of Omar Adillahu Anhu. These are basically different battles that took place. We don't want to go into them. Then in the time of Umar, then the conquest started going towards Sham, which is greater Syria and the surrounding countries. So in there, they conquered, in there they conquered Damascus, which was the capital of Syria, which was a big blow to the Persian Empire. The capital has been taken. And then we had Hims, which is another important place. Then we had, these are different places. And in time of Umar, the Jerusalem was also conquered. So the Muslims, they gained uh, control over Jerusalem. So Baytul Maqdis. And then so going, then there was a plague. And then there was conquest of Egypt. Egypt, as we know, is in North Africa. So that's when the expedition, first, so now we're, they're expanding towards even North Africa. So they're constantly just mapping out now. So North Africa. And then we'll see in the time of Mu'awiyah, the entire North Africa was taken. So all the countries, and then right at the end was Algeria and Morocco. Then these were taken time of Mu'awiyah. So basically the Persian Empire comes to an end, but half of the Roman Empire is gone in the time of Umar. And then Umar passes away in Fajr Salah. He is stabbed by a Majusi slave who belonged to Abu um, uh, Mughir ibn Shurba. And the caliphate after him, so Umar nominated six people, Ali, Uthman, Zubair, Sa'ad, Talhan, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, and he said that you decide amongst yourselves. And ultimately, who became the Khalifa? Uthman. By the way, everyone feel free to respond, yeah? So, good. MashaAllah. Uthman radiallahu anhu became Khalifa. Okay, so that was a slightly easy question. Now the a bit more difficult question, which let's see how many people can respond. Even if you get it wrong, it's fine. So how many years did, so now, so Umar then passed away 23 AH. So add this to your timeline. So we have 11 AH, the Prophet passed away, two, and a, two years and three months. And so in 13 AH, Abu Bakr passed away. In year 23, Umar then passed away. Then we had Uthman. Anyone know how many years Uthman ruled for? Anyone know? Anyone else? Okay. Ruthman radiallahu anhu, he was actually the longest uh, Khalifa from the Khulafa Rashidi. Yeah, from the Khulafa Rashidi, he was the longest Khalifa. He ruled for the longest. The Khulafa Rashidi, by the way, Abu Bakr, first one, Umar, and the third one is Uthman. Okay, so Uthman ibn Affan, he passed away in 35 AH, and Umar passed away in 23 AH, which means his Khilafah was about 12 years. So he lived a very long life. He passed at the age of 82. So he's five years younger than the Prophet Sallallahu and his caliphate lasted for 12 years. And he was one of the earliest converts. Soon as Abu Bakr became a Muslim, he brought many others to Islam on the either the same day or the next day. And one of those was Uthman ibn Affan. So he was a very early convert and he was very close to the Prophet. 
So he married Ruqayya, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When she passed away, the Prophet married his second daughter, Umm Kulthum. And the Prophet said, if I had 10 daughters, I'd marry them all to Uthman. And so this is how much he was beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Okay, so his caliphate. So when he became Khalifa, he, he started by removing the old governors and replacing them with new governors. And by the way, one thing I forgot to mention is during the, uh, during the era of Umar radiallahu anhu, he had, a, he had one very important policy, which is he did not like sending, he, he did not permit the Sahaba to leave Medina. They had to stay in Medina or Hijaz, the Hijaz and Makkah Medina area. They had to stay there. Unless it's absolutely crucial that he needed to send a companion, the elite of the Sahaba, by the way, the elite of the Sahaba, he did not permit them to move. Unless there was like an emergency where they had to, he had to send someone as a governor or to teach a, you know, become a teacher in a country or something like that. But generally, his policy was he wanted all the elite Sahab stay in Medina. Number one, so that they're unified. Number two, so that he can use them for mashwara, because obviously Umar is, is deciding so many things for the entire vast empire that they have now. So he wanted to use them for mashwara, ask them for their opinions, and so on. And he wanted them to be wanted them to be unified as well together. So that was his policy. But Uthman radiallahu anhu is a lot more lax. He's very relaxed in this and he permitted them all. Um, he didn't have that policy. So he started by replacing his previous governors. So he sent to Kufa Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas. So yeah, before him, the, the, the governor was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And he is crucial to Hanafi fiqh. Hanafi fiqh basically is based upon the fiqh of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So Umar radiallahu anhu, basically the people of Kufa complained to uh, uh, the people of Kufa, they complained to Umar radiallahu anhu that we need, we need someone to teach us and so on. And the, uh, Umar radiallahu anhu responded back to them. He said that I'm, I've, pref I've preferred you, the people of Kufa, um, more than myself, meaning by sending you Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, meaning I wanted him with me in Medina, but I'm going to prefer you over myself. So he sent them Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So he stayed there for quite a long time, um, Abdullah Masrud. And then he, he had many students. That's in Ibn Qayyim, Rahimullah, in Alam Luqin. He mentions about 32 students or so of, Umar, um, of Abdullah ibn Masrud. He had many, basically. And he was the main teacher and his, in Kufa and his fiqh and his knowledge spread there. But we're going to look into Abdullah ibn Masrud a bit more afterwards. So then so Uthman Radilani replaced all, all of these go governors. In Basra was Abu Musa Ash'ari. So he was the governor there. Anas Radilan also moved there as well. So they had companions. So these Sahaba now, this, they're, they're basically, the whole purpose of going through this is so that we understand the Sahaba, they're spreading to different lands. And the Sahaba, obviously, they have knowledge of the Quran, they have knowledge of the Hadith. And we discussed in the previous sessions that Sahaba, they had different Hadiths with them. Some Sahaba, um, one Sahabi didn't hear a Hadith, one Sahabi did do a, hear a Hadith, one Sahabi, they heard Hadiths from their own perception. So they have different knowledge that they're taking with them and they're passing on their knowledge to the lands that they're going to. So then um, they read Quras. Okay, so, okay, so Uthman radiallahu anhu, so he's continue, he doesn't do much expansion. So by when Umar Radan passed away, many of the, uh, basically the, the countries and the borders, they started fighting back. So he's basically consolidating the empire again. So he's having to reconquer what was already previously conquered. So there wasn't much expansion in time of Uthman radiallahu anhu. And except for Muawi radiallahu anhu, so he was the first person to actually, um, so he sought permission uh, for a navy. And then they went and they conquered Cyprus. So this is when Cyprus was conquered in 28 AH. So under Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. So Muawiyah wrote to Uthman saying that, you know, I need, I want a navy and so on. Uh, but generally, because the Arabs had never traveled on water before, they were, you know, just desert people who were living in the deserts. So they were very hesitant. That's why Umar radiallahu said no to Muawiyah before. He even asked Umar, can I have build a navy to go expand the Muslim territory? Umar said no, uh, because they were, this was this wasn't their territory. They were very uncomfortable over water. So Uthman gave him permission. He said, okay, Muawi, you can go as long as you take your wife, wife with you and your family, basically. So meaning, uh, so he knows that it's safe, basically. So Sahaba, they went to even Cyprus. So imagine the knowledge is spreading Cyprus and conquest of North Africa. So a lot of these things are taking place. 
And then party of his Khalifa, when the movement against Uthman is started, we're not going to go into this detail. So basically, Uthman's Khilaf is divided into two periods. One is the period where everything was positive, where everything's good. And after six years, then everything started going downhill. People, he started having many enemies. People started revolting against him. The Kharijis, the, the rebels, they started coming out. And there's, yeah, so people uh, um, basically, they didn't agree with many of Uthman's policies. So they started making up stuff against him, started movement against him until eventually that led to his death. And so basically Uthman, he was assassinated by a group of Muslim rebels in his own house. And these are some of the claims against Uthman. Okay, so you can read over that later. So he passed away 35 AH at the age of 82. So in his era, many of the Sahaba that went out and they went to different, different places. Okay. Oh, no, I don't know. Okay. So um, just add this to your timeline. So we have Abu Bakr, uh, the Prophet 11 AH passed away. Then you have Abu Bakr in 13. They have Umar in, was it, 23. And then you have Uthman in 35. And next Khalifa was Ali. Anyone know how many years he ruled? Or any guesses? Any guesses? No one? Mashallah, Mumin you know Adan said, Did you Google that or did you know that? I'm guessing you knew that, right? Okay. Mashallah, good stuff. Yeah, so he ruled for about five years. So Ali radiallahu anhu. Okay, can everyone else hear me? So someone just said the sound is quite low. How is the sound for everyone else? I can hear you. Okay, and okay, so it must be from your end something. So just double check the sound, uh, maybe the volume's all the way up. And if that doesn't work, just log out and log back in. Sometimes that helps. Okay, so it's fine for everyone else, yeah. So double check your sound is high and if still you can log back out, log out and log back in. Okay, so we have Ali ibn Abi Talib, which was a cousin of the Prophet. ﷺ. So he becomes the Khalifa. And so after Uthman Radilan passes away, there was there was no Khalifa for about a week. Because now so this was a very this was the first fitna in the Muslim, first civil war. Uh, not civil, we didn't well, first fitna in the Muslim. Uh, in, the, in the Muslim time, was the assassination of Uthman radiallahu anhu. So now, for a week, there was no Khalifa. And because no one wanted to really take up this position, because let's say if you hasten towards the Khalifa, what might people think about you? That were you accomplice in the killing of Uthman? Because remember, this was the Muslims. So were you trying to get rid of him so that you can become a Khalifa? So it's a very, very dark period in Islam. So then people came to Ali radiallahu anhu, and they, they said, we want you to become a Khalifa, and they accepted. Although he knew the risks that he posed, they have so many enemies against him. People might even, people started associating with the killing of Uthman, and so on. So he took up, because their desire to preserve Islam was greater than their own lives. So that's why they took it up. So his, his Khilafah lasted about five, um, just under five years, actually. So basically, we just say five years just to make it short, but four months, four years, seven years, sorry, four years, seven months, and so on, you know, something. Yeah? So the Khilafah Rashida, the widely guided Khulafah, Khilafah Rashida comes to an end at 40 AH. So add this to your timeline, 40 AH. So he ruled for just under five years. So he was again, one of the earliest converts. He became a Muslim at the age of 10. I'm supposed to ask you that question, but anyway, he became Muslim at the age of 10. So he's very young. And he also married the daughter of, a daughter of the Prophet and Fatima. And he had a daughter called Umm Kulthum and who he married to Umar radiallahu anhu. Okay, so his first move was that he moved his Khilafah from, right now the capital of the Khilafah was Medina. So in the period of Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman, the capital of the Islamic empire was Medina. But he thought that, okay, Umar Uthman was murdered, uh, was assassinated in Medina, there's many enemies there and so on. And Ali radiallahu anhu Jenny had a lot of support in Iraq, in Kufa. So he thought it would be best uh, strategically to move the capital to Kufa. So he uh, moved it from Medina 
to Iran. Now, Ali radiallahu anhu is moving to Kufa. Before that, we had Ab um, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and you had Abu Musa Ash'ari at one point as well. So many of the Sahaba, and some authors are right, even up to a thousand Sahaba moved to Iraq. So Iraq became a learning center, just like Makkah and Medina were learning centers at the time, due to so many Sahaba traveling there, and especially Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who had such a high status in knowledge, and we're going to get to him when we learn about him. Uh, so Kufa became one of the main learning centers of the time. And uh, Hijaz, Makkah and Medina, they also were one of the main learning centers at the time. Baghdad was not a learning center at this stage. Who can tell me why Baghdad was not a learning center at this stage? Anyone? The way Imam Ahmed ibn Hamal comes from. Baghdad was not anything special right now. Anyone can tell me? Why? I hope everyone knows the answer. Everyone should. No one? I don't know what Well, technically, that probably is correct. No Muslims were there. Because it didn't exist yet. Remember when I said it, it when did it come into existence? In which empire? Who remembers from the beginning? No one remember? Yes, remember I said uh, Baghdad was in, uh, created in the era of um, the Abbasids. So the Abbasid Empire were the ones to build Kufa. So this that was like you know much later, much later, sorry Baghdad. So that was much later. So Baghdad doesn't exist yet. That's why there's no one. There's nothing special about Baghdad right now. Okay. So we had likewise. So Muslims they conquered Sham as well. So they had Syria, Palestine. So uh, many Sahaba they went there as well. So said Abu Darda was a very famous companion. He was the Qadi, the judge of Damascus. We had um, Amr ibn al-As, who, um, he was a conqueror of Egypt and he stayed in Egypt. And so he had many students in Egypt. So the Sahaba, they're basically traveling the, as judges, as teachers to different, different places. And then they emanate, they pass on their knowledge to their students. And then their students are called the Tabi'een. Tab, the word tabi' in Arabic means to, a follower. So they, the tabi'in are the followers of the Sahaba, but technically a tabi' from an Islamic, uh, Islamic definition of a tabi' is someone who saw the Sahaba and they were Muslims. But anyway, so Uthman then passes away. Oh no, I got rid of Ali radiallahu anhu. Sorry, one second. So let me just bring Ali radiallahu document topic. Okay, so then we had Ali radiallahu anhu. Okay, so let's look at him. So he became Muslim at the age of 10. So again, he replaced Abu um, Uthman's governors. That's the first thing he did. Generally, the Sahaba wouldn't keep, they'd replace governors um, just to control their power. Because sometimes what happens, this is the foresight of the Sahaba. So in, in history, you know, what happens is that you have civil wars where a governor is there for too long, then he starts taking too much power. And then because over the years, his power becomes grows and grows and grows and grows. He feels entitled to become the Khalifa, and then civil wars start. And that's what happened in the Roman Empire. This is what happened in you know, the empires before. So the Sahaba had a lot of foresight. And so that's why they would always, always be removing governors every couple of years and rotate governors. So by the way, anyone, there was one exception. Who was that one exception who was a governor for a very long time? Anyone know? Umar radiallahu anhu appointed him. And he was a governor all the way through Umar radiallahu anhu, which is extraordinary. And then he was a governor all the way through Uthman. For 20 years, his governor and governorship lasted. No Khalid ibn Walid. Khalid ibn Walid was actually demoted. Umar radiallahu anhu, I believe it was. Um, was it Abu Bakr or Umar? One of them actually demoted him. Um, he, because obviously, um, so in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, it was Khalid ibn Walid that was getting all the conquests. So every battle the Khan Walid fought, they were winning. And that's why he was known as the hero of the period of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And I believe it was Umar radiallahu anhu that wanted him to be de 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 uh, demoted. But Umar, Abu Bakr said, no. Abu Bakr said, how can I unsheath the sword that Allah has set uh, against the enemies? But I believe in the time of Umar, it must have been there. 
that Omar actually demoted him. So because people started looking towards Khalid as if it's Khalid the one that's bringing his conquest, where it's not Khalid, it's Allah. Yeah, so he actually took away his uh, leadership and made him as a normal soldier amongst the army. So even Khalid Walid, despite his brilliance and his excellence, he did not remain a general of the army. So these were, these were just the policies of the Sahaba. And it wasn't Bilal, it was actually um, uh, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. Muawiyah, we'll see that he actually became a Khalifa after Ali radiallahu anhu. He had been a governor of Sham for 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. And his power just kept on growing and growing and growing and growing. And when Ali Radiyam became a Khalifa, the others, they pledged their allegiance to him. But Muawiyah Radiyallahu actually refused to pledge his allegiance to Ali Radiyallahu Anhu. And then the whole controversy started. Ali of over the, the revenge for Uthman. So Ali Radiyallahu Anhu said, okay, we're not going to take those people who basically participated in this to account yet. We're going to let the matter settle down. Let me consolidate my power. And then after I've consolidated my power, we'll search those people who participated in killing of Uthman. Then we'll um, give them punishment. So that was Ali radiallahu anhu. And we believe that Ali radiallahu was in the right. But Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he was actually related to Uthman. They were from the same, uh, they were from Banu Umayyah, same tribe. But Muawiyah radiallahu anhu thought that, you know what? We want justice right now. And and before, uh, I will not pledge our allegiance to you until you, um, um, you basically uh, revenge Uthman. And Muawiyah radiallahu anhu actually saw Ali as a illegitimate Khalifa, because how can a Khalifa not have power to take revenge or enact punishment to, uh, for killing the previous Khalifa? How, how can you be a Khalifa and not have that power? So Muawiyah actually said, you know, I'm not going to pledge my allegiance to you until you do this. And on that, when Aisha Radhan heard of this, she agreed with it. So Aisha Radhan joined Muawiyah on no side. And then you had Talha, Zubair, great companions who joined that side as well. So then you had basically the first civil war that took, uh, the first civil war that took place between the Sahaba. And by the way, when, uh, when we talk about this, the Sahaba, both sides, they were doing it for Allah. No one was doing it for any personal reasons. So they opposed Ali Radiyallahu Anhu's policy because they believed 100% that this is the right thing and this is what Allah wants from us. Ali Radiyallahu Anhu opposed them because he believed that he was 100% on the right. So this was an ijtihad of the Sahaba. That's why no one after them can say anything about the intention of the Sahaba. They were the greatest people, Muawiyah Radiyallahu Anhu and those who joined him. Even though they fought Ali's side, they were from the greatest of all people. Why? Because yes, we may disagree with um, with the ijtihad, but at the end of the day, the ijtihad was based upon what would be good for this team. That's all they wanted. So yes, we may say that Ali Radhan was on the right, as uh, people from the Sunnah al-Jamaah, but we cannot, co- we cannot say anything regarding the intention of Sahaba. They were the greatest of people to have ever lived. Yeah? So that's why we don't actually... That's why we don't actually... We, we don't discuss these issues that this, um, took place between the Sahaba because sometimes people listening, they can, have, they can create ill intentions um, towards the Sahaba because obviously we don't know, we went there, we don't know exactly what happened. We just have these bits of facts, which you know, we, half are formulated, half are unformulated. So that's why when we hear them hearing just bits of information, I think, you know, did he do it for power? Did he do it for money or greed? Because we went there. But anyway. So basically the first, Muawiyah is a Sahabi. He was, he became, he accepted Islam, I believe in the seventh year after Hijrah. Um, so a bit later, roughly around that period. So Muawiyah was actually, he was one of the scribes of the Prophet So he'd, he'd write letters to the emperors and generals and other people. And he would even write the revelation of the Prophet so he's a very close companion to the Prophet and the Prophet actually made dua for him. Uh, the Prophet said, oh Allah, make him, uh, guide him and make him from amongst those who guide others. So the leadership, so even Muawiyah said, like when I heard the Prophet making this dua, I always wanted to become a leader. And I knew that, you know, one day I would become a leader. So Muawiyah was quite close to the Prophet in the later, year, in later years. Okay, but anyway, so then the Battle of the Camel took place with Aisha and one of the main people involved as well. And then, uh, then you had Battle of Sifin that took place a couple of months later. 
and then the Kharijis, the rebels, who basically turned against Uthman, they turned against Ali radiallahu anhu. First they supported him and then they turned against him. And then they declared Ali radiallahu anhu as a non-believer. And this end led to the assassination of Ali radiallahu anhu, 40 year age, where he went to lead the Salah uh, and then he was stabbed and killed. And then for about six months, people pledged their allegiance to Hassan radiallahu anhu. I don't know why I'm going through this. I wasn't supposed to go through this in, in this. This is supposed to be a quick five to ten minutes. Not spend way too long on this. But anyway, um, so Hassan radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa for about six months or so, and at that same time, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, um, because now imagine the power of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. He's been governor for twenty years. He controls the entire Sham, which is Syria, Jerusalem, Lebanon. You know all these uh, Palestine and all these different areas. So he has a huge army. And Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he had the greatest army at that at that period. Because his army are loyal to him. They're very trained and skilled fighters. So Muawiyah, he had the capability to protect the Islamic empire and move it forward. And Hassan he doesn't have that much. He doesn't have a greater army as, as him. Yeah. And all, or maybe not even political awareness and political knowledge as Muawiyah. Muawiyah was an expert politician. He was famous for being the greatest politician. Perhaps a greater politician than Ali, Ali radiallahu anhu. Yes, Ali radiallahu anhu, he had the piety. He was extremely pious. He knew the sunnah of the Prophet inside out. He had the knowledge of the Sharia way better than Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. Yes, but from a pol politician perspective, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he knew how to deal with the people. And it's famous about Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. Whenever there'd be disputes and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu would get involved, everyone would, and everyone would leave happy. So he knew how to make people happy as well. So that's why many people that opted for Muawiyah than to become the uh, next Khalifa, because they knew that he can get the job done. All, although may, there may be others that are more pious than him, have more knowledge of the Sharia than him, but in terms of political expertise, no one could match Muawiyah. So that's why he was elected to be the Khalifa as well. So now there was about to be another civil war between Hassan who has been nominated as Khalifa and then Muawiyah. But then Hassan, he gives up his claim towards the Khalifa, Khilafa in exchange for Muawiyah. And this was predicted by the Prophet as well in his life. The Prophet, in, when the, while Hassan was still a child, the Prophet told, said to him that this son of mine will become a leader and the Muslim will be unified through him. So this was a prophecy of the Prophet Islam. And then after him, we're not going to go into in detail, was Muawiyah anhu. So now he was the, and now the, it turns into a dynasty basically. Now the Khilafah passes on through his lineage. So dynasty is when your son and then your, his son and then his son uh, continues to rule. So this is a dynasty. So it went from the Khilafah to more of a dynasty um, approach now. So Muawiyah he, he was the Khalifa for the next 20 years. Uh, and this was seen as a, a period of peace, um, expansion. So this was a very, very good period for the Muslims. After about 15, 20 years of a bit of um, problems here and there. So we're not going to go through his life. Um, let's see. So now he started more conquests. And they actually reached, in his period, the um, northern part of Iran, known as Khurasan. Khurasan was many of the Hadith scholars that came from Khurasan and all that, all that area. And he reached up to Kabul, modern day Afghanistan. He reached Sindh, modern day Pakistan. Um, let's see. So the, all of North Africa was conquered, including modern day Algeria. Um, so other Greek islands were conquered as well, and so on. And then before he passed away, he appointed his son Yazid to become the Khalifa, which again created controversy and so on. And these are some references. But anyway, if anyone wants to, st if you're, if anyone wants to study the lives of the Khulafa, there's a there's a brilliant book. Um, it's called the the Caliphate of the Four Vited Guided Caliphs. Um, it's about three hundred pages. It's an excellent book. I'd say it's the best thing um, to read in English in terms of the four Khali uh, as an introductory work. It's very good. So if anyone wants the reference for that, just let me know afterwards and I'll send you a picture of the book. And then after that is, the, you know, the, the series, the Abu Bakr, Omar Uthman Ali, I think by Dr. Salabi, I think his name is. So generally, then that's like the next stage if anyone wants to study the lives of the Khulafa. Okay, but anyway, so now, so basically the whole point of this, just to show that in the time of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, the Muslims were expanding to different, uh, different lands very quickly. 
and Islam is spreading to all different parts of the different parts of the world. And the Sahaba going there with the knowledges, they're becoming governors, the teachers, and they're passing on their knowledge to the generation after them. So we're gonna we're not gonna go all the way up till three o'clock. Um, we'll finish probably in about fifteen minutes or so. And if anyone has any questions, we'll take questions. So now the main thing I actually did want to go through is are my notes here. So let me share my screen. Okay, so let me... okay, so session three, today's session actually starts from this. I don't know why I spent so long on that. Um, but yeah, session three actually starts from this. This is what this was my intention. I thought before the lesson, it just occurred to me that you know what, let me just quickly discuss the Khilafah Rashida. Maybe the students will benefit. So you'll have more of a map, bird's eye view knowledge in front of you. Generally, when I study something, I need to have a bird's eye view knowledge of all the different components where they fit in, or else it's I just don't like it. So I thought, you know what. But anyway, so we had the, the when the Prophet passed away. So everyone, please do make notes of these. These should these should be dates ingrained in everyone. Yeah. So the Prophet passed away. Which year? Everyone on the chat. Which year did the Prophet pass away? Okay, so everyone should have written it down. Yeah. And then Abu Bakr, which year did he pass away? And his Khilafah came to an end. Thirteen. Go try and type as quickly as you can, yeah. Just so I know that you guys know it, yeah. So thirteen AH, good. And then Umar radiallahu anhu ruled for ten years. When did he pass away? Twenty three, good. And then Uthman radiallahu anhu ruled. When did he pass away? Thirty five, good. So he ruled for twelve years. And then Ali radiallahu anhu, which year did he pass away? Forty, good. Mashallah. Okay, we're, we're coming to, in terms of the spreading of knowledge, we're going to come to that now. So I, I just gave like a historical overview. So we're going to come to the knowledge part now. Okay, and then you can say Muawir had done rule for 20 years, so he passed away, I, I believe he was 60, 60 year age, so you can add that in. So Muawir was the first Khalifa of the Umayyad dynasty. Muawir first Khalifa of the Umayyad dynasty. So he passed away about 60 year age, so he ruled for 20 years before he passed away. And then I believe his son Yazid ruled for about four years and and so on, but we're not going to get into that now. And the uh, Umayyad dynasty lasted for about 63 years until the Abbasids took over. And they then, then the Abbasids ruled for a couple of hundred years, but you know, that's another story for another day. Okay. Okay, so now in terms of knowledge. Now, so Sahaba are done spread in different lands as governor. These are just my personal, these are just my personal notes, by the way. So I don't have slides for this session. I just thought I'll just share my notes with the students. So you can just benefit from my notes. And by the way, these students, these notes I'm still working on, I'm still doing research on this. I'm still reading more and more and more and still get adding to my notes. Yeah, so I, like I said in the beginning, I'm just a student for knowledge, just sharing some things with other students. Yeah, so there's no hierarchy between us that I'm, you know, we're all the same, yeah? So I just, I'm sharing some of my notes. Okay, so Sahaba are on spreading different lands as governors, conquerors, Persia, Rome, North Africa, and so on. So in terms of now, what, okay, now this is extremely important that we understand this. Were all the Sahaba, which dates, were they all, you know, let's, you know, let's say I would say next level scholars that knew everything to do with Sharia and they were masters in fiqh and hadith and tafsir. The answer to that is no, they weren't. Many Sahaba, they have basic knowledge in Islam. Like we have more knowledge today than many of the Sahaba that were there. And, you know, this isn't an insult to the Sahaba. They, even without their knowledge, they were still the greatest people to have ever lived. We can never match the Sahaba, yeah? Some Sahaba, they only knew the five pillars. Sometimes they come to the Prophet Sallallahu stay with him for a short amount of time. And the Prophet teach them how to pray Salah, Wudu, the five pillars of Islam. They'd go back to their places and they'd teach whatever they knew. Sahaba, many Sahaba are working. Imagine, let's say, your local imam, yeah? How much time do you spend with your local imam learning, learning deen? You, you have your work, you come back, you spend some time with your family, you go see your local imam in the masjid, you speak to him briefly every now and then, and you learn from him. And, you know, so this, the Prophet was living in Medina, and he spent many sah some sahaba with him all the time, some sahaba, but most obviously they couldn't do that. They had to work, they had to spend time with their families. Even Umar Adil, such a great sahabi, he had to split his time between him and someone else. That one day you go to the Prophet, one day I'll go to the Prophet. 
So these people spend different times with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some companions stayed with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for a few years, and then they went to their own places, and then they started teaching what they knew. Some Sahaba, the Prophet Sallallahu in his lifetime, sent, him, sent them away as governors and so on. Yeah? So not all Sahaba understood the entirety of deen as we do today. Yeah? They had fragments of knowledge, um, but there were some elite of the Sahaba that understood it entirely. That they understood the abrogated hadith to the abrogator. They understood the different contexts of the revelations. They understood everything to do with it. So they were basic experts, yeah? So now, now in terms of being a jurist and giving fatwa and giving their own opinion to those things which weren't mentioned in the Quran and hadith, this is a very, very high task. And not everyone could do that. Yes, if something's mentioned in the Quran and hadith, they could quote it. But what if it's not? Now, to exercise your own ijtihad was a very difficult task. And not all sahaba could do that, or they wouldn't. So now, for amongst the Sahaba, fatwa, to have given fatwa is only recorded from 430 companions. This is mentioned in Alam al muwaqqiin by Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi, the famous student of Shaykh Islam in Taymiyyah. Yeah, so only 130 Sahaba, which is a shock. Imagine a thousand, a thousand, a thousand Sahaba, only 130, yeah, to have recorded fatwa. So if I ask, you know, even from, you know, today, let's say in, my, in our town, you know, how many people have given fatwa? Fatwa is, by the way, when someone asks you for your opinion on a matter and you give your own opinion regarding a matter, imagine that, you know, every person probably giving fatwa. Nowadays, the average person gives more fatwas than the mufti, by the way. Yeah, that's just how it is. So 130 Sahaba fatwas recorded from them. And who the most active from amongst them was seven. There were seven companions who were the most active in giving fatwa. Umar radiallahu anhu, Umar ibn Khattab, Ali radiallahu anhu, Aisha radiallahu anha, you have Zayd ibn Thabit, Abdullah ibn Abbas, which is a, who is a cousin of the Prophet His uncle was Abbas. Yeah, his father's brother, the Prophet's father's brother was Abbas. His son was Abdullah. And they had uh, Ibn Umar, who was Umar radiallahu anhu's son, Abdullah ibn Umar. Then you had Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Yeah. So these seven companions were the most active and the most knowledgeable in fatwa. By the way, just a quick question. Let's see you can respond the quickest. Um, which uh, city did Abdullah ibn Mas'ud rule over as a governor? Anyone know? Good. Mashallah. Kufa, yes. Okay. So the seven, seven muftis of the Sahaba were basically them. Umar, Ali, Aisha. Aisha was, she, when the Prophet passed away, Aisha then was about 18 years old. And she was from the greatest, um, let's say, um, Imam Zahabi, the famous, another famous student of Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, one of the greatest historians who have ever lived. He says regarding Aisha, there's never been a woman who is more knowledgeable in fiqh than Aisha. Anha. So Aisha then she had tremendous amount of knowledge. The Sahaba, the elite of the Sahaba would even go to her to ask a question, especially about inheritance issues and things like that. So, I met in the, um, so Ibn, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimullah, he says that there were few, the Sahaba, they were in the, in the middle category in terms of giving fatwa, meaning they weren't giving fatwa extensively, neither were they so less. But basically, in the middle category, puts Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, Uthman, radiallahu anhu, and so on, and many others as well. And the reason why Abu Bakr and Uthman, so there's many others, but I just wrote these two names down, is not because they were knowledgeable, it's because they hesitate, some of them, they hesitated to give their own opinion and they did not like it at all. Yeah, because what if I'm wrong? So basically piety overpowered them. So due to that, they would give less fatwa, not because they were knowledgeable. And then you had those who only one or two fatwas recorded from them. There's many of them, yeah? But in total, there are about 130 companions who would give fatwa. And many people after the tabi'un, they would say, knowledge spread from the companions of four individuals. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Zayd ibn Thabit, Abdullah ibn Abbas, and Abdullah ibn Umar. So basically the knowledge of the next generations basically comes from generally these four. And I would say after studying their lives, even Aisha radiallahu would be included in that. Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu, he wouldn't sit down as a teacher in a masjid because obviously he was, he was busy with doing qada, acting as a judge. He was busy with political affairs. So he didn't have time. He wouldn't have time to sit down in a masjid and do local lessons. So that's why Umar, despite his knowledge, he wouldn't be mentioned as that because he was busy with the affairs of the empire. And so we had Aisha, she extremely knowledgeable. She would teach. Abdullah ibn Abbas. And okay, so we'll come to them now. So let's just look at briefly who these individuals were. 
So a lot of this is taken from Siyar Alam in Nubala by Imam Dahabi and some of the, uh, basically the older books, yeah? So although I haven't referenced a lot of stuff, but generally it's all from Siyar Alam Nubala and the previous classical sources. Okay. So Aisha radiallahu anha was obviously the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, and she is known as the Afqa of the Ummah, of the women of the Ummah. She was the most knowledgeable woman in the Ummah. And the Prophet married her about 10 months before migration to Medina, which was after 13 years of prophethood. And then the marriage was consummated the second year after Hijrah. So she learned from her father, obviously. She passed and from the Prophet because obviously she was the closest person to the Prophet One Sahabi, I believe, was Amr ibn Asked asked, asked the Prophet who is the most beloved person to you? He said, Aisha. So Aisha was unanimously the most beloved person to the Prophet and she was and she was extremely intelligent and she had extremely good memory because of her young age. So she learned from her father Abu Bakr. She also learned from Umar and Fatima and from others around her. And she passed on a wealth of knowledge to the next generation. And she had many students. For example, Said and Musa. By the way, these are just going to be names to you at the moment. But and I will discuss who these people were. Uh, we're not going to have time now, so it'll be next week, uh, our next session, inshallah. We're going to go through who these people were. Okay. Okay. So she had many students. So Aisha, by the way, she lived in Medina. So her, you know, the Medinan school. By the way, uh, which imam comes from Medina, from the four imams of fiqh? You can tell me. Which imam comes from Medina? Good, yes, Imam Malik. Yeah? So right now, so Medina is also, so Imam Malik, rahimullah, he inherited the ilm of Aisha and Zayd ibn Thabit. He was, Zayd ibn Thabit was a, the, mufti, the mufti of Medina, by the way. Yeah? And Abdullah ibn Umar was also um, one of the muftis of Medina. Yeah, so Imam Malik, uh, rahimullah, he's inheriting all this knowledge. So this is going to build up to the Maliki fiqh. Yeah, so that's why we're starting right from the Sahaba. We're going to see who their students were, who their students were, until it comes to Imam Malik, rahimullah. So we're going to, and then we're going to look into the life of Imam Malik afterwards. Then a bit of some things to the usul and principles of the madhab, what makes him different to the other schools. Then we're going to do the same for the Malik um, Hanafi school. Look at the source and the history and how it came to become the Hanafi school. And again for the Shafi and for the Hanbali school. So that at the end of this, inshallah, everyone will have a good understanding of what the madhabs are, how they're different, and where they came from. Yeah, right, for starting from the Sahaba radhiyallahu anhu, inshallah. Okay. Okay, so this is Aisha Radila. She had many students, Sa'id al Musayyab. He was known as the Sayyid al Tabi'in and the Mufti of Medina. We had Tawus, Ashabi, Urwa. Urwa was um, Aisha's nephew. We're going to learn about him a bit more. Atab Nabi Rabah. He was the Mufti of Faqi and Muhaddith of Mecca. We had Ikrama al Qama. And al Qama was the Mufti and Mushtahid of Kufa. But basically, many had studied with her, and we'll get into these a bit more. So, in the Mus there's a Musnad attributed to Aisha Radilana. So, she narrated about over more than 2,000 hadiths from the Prophet. Okay, and Ibn Imam Dahabi writes in the Seer, there's, there's not a single woman um, by far more knowledgeable than Aisha Radilana. And Aisha Radilana, just a few things about her. As we know this from the Sirah, her nikah with the Prophet was decided by Allah and shown to her in a dream. And we understood her stance when it came to demanding justice for Muawiyah and her. And the companions would come to learn from her. So for example, Masruq, he's a famous tabi'i and a jurist. So he says, um, so we asked, so قُلْنَا لَهُ هَلْ كَانَتَ عَيْشَ تُحْسِنُ الْفَرَائِذِ uh, so he says that we saw the Akabir, the elite of the Sahaba, would go to Aisha radiallahu anha. Such a young person. The, the elite of the Sahaba and the Akabir would go to Aisha radiallahu anha and ask about Faraid. Faraid is basically inheritance. 
saying uh, another tabi reports لقد صاحبت عائشة فما رأيت أحد قد كان عالم بآية أنزلت ولا بفريضة ولا بسنة ولا بشعر he said, I accompanied Aisha radiallahu anha. I have not seen anyone more knowledgeable than any verse which has been revealed, neither regarding inheritance, neither regarding sunnah, neither regarding poetry, and so on and so on. And then he says medicine. And he says, I've never seen anyone more knowledgeable about medicine. So they were, conf like, they were confused, like, how medicine? Like, I can stand the other Islamic knowledge, but how did she know about medicine? And then Asha says that, you know, in the days when the Prophet would become ill, many people would come and they'd give their doctor advice to the Prophet Islam. And then she said, just by hearing other people, she started memorizing all these different stuff and learning and she, until she became someone actually quite knowledgeable in medicine as well. But anyway. So Atay ibn Abi Rabah, the, scholar, the main scholar of Makkah. Atay ibn Abi Rabah, by the way, he was the main student of Abdullah ibn Abbas. Atay ibn Abi Rabah was the main student of Abdullah ibn Abbas. Anyone know which, which city Abdullah ibn Abbas went and lived? Anyone know? It wasn't Medina, by the way. Okay, it was, it was Makkah. So Abdullah ibn Abbas was the main teacher in Mecca. So after the conquest of Mecca, so first, obviously, Abdullah ibn Abbas was living in Medina with the Prophet ﷺ. But after Mecca was conquered, they needed someone very knowledgeable to teach them. So that's why Abdullah ibn Abbas was sent to live in Mecca, so he can become the teacher there. So he was the main Sahabi in Mecca living. And his main student was Ata ibn Abi Rabah. Okay, so then, so Atab Nabi Rabah says, She was the most knowledgeable of people. Um, he was another great scholar. We'll learn about him afterwards. If the, Aish, if the knowledge of Aisha was compared or put together and compared with the knowledge of all the women that exist, her knowledge will be greater. And she passed away in the period, in the reign of Marwan ibn al-Hakam. He was a Umayyad Khalifa, and she's buried in night, and her janazah was led by Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu. Okay, so what we're going to do is, I think we've done a lot of information today, and I don't want to do too much. So when we learn too much, everything, everything is forgotten. So next session, next session is a very interesting session, inshallah. So I'll just tell you what we're going to learn about next session. Is Next session, we're going to go through Abdullah, who Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was. And he was obviously the main jurist of Kufa, we learned, and how his students and then their students and their, their students led to the Hanafi fiqh. So we're going to learn who, uh, a bit about his life, about Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And then we're going to learn about Zayd ibn Thabit, who he was, his knowledge, and how he affected the generations after him and who his students were. And again, Abdullah ibn Abbas, this is the main jurist of the Sahaba. So to understand how the madhabs were formed, we need to understand who these Sahaba were. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, and then we have Abdullah ibn Umar. And then we have Abu Darda. Any, anyone remember where Abu Darda was sent? This is really smart. I mentioned him once as a passing comment today. Anyone remember where Abu Darda was sent to become a governor? Any guesses? Which city? Or region? No one? Does everyone asleep? I think everyone's asleep. Yes, mashallah. Sham, Damascus. Good. Yeah, so he was, that's why Abu Darda is here. So his knowledge passed on to, um, he had one uh, very famous student who became the judge known as the Qadi of Damascus after him was Abu Idris al Khawlani. So we can learn a bit about him. And then we have the Fuqa of Medina. So first is the Tabi'in generation. Yeah, so who were the main tabi'in who took for the Sahaba in Medina? And then who are the next generation of scholars until it comes to Imam Malik? And then the same thing for the other cities, basically. We're going to learn a bit more. And then we'll learn who are the main tabi'in scholars who led to basically who were the pioneers in the formation of the schools. So inshallah, we'll go through that next session. Okay. Any questions about anything I've done today? Anyone to ask anything? Or anything that you've missed that uh, I went through it too quickly and just want me to re-explain something.
So there was a lot to take in. I hope students take notes. The notes are extremely important. If we're not taking notes, what happens is we'll forget everything and we lose everything that we've gained. Yeah, so notes are very important. Um, so I hope you made a timeline with the death. So we should have, a, you should have a, so from this lesson, lesson, you should take back the death dates and who the Khulafa Rashidin were and when they died and briefly what happened. Not in detail, but you should know briefly what happened in each of their periods. So consolidation, um, uh, expansion, generally briefly what places were conquered. And then we discussed very important who the Fuqaha of the Sahaba were. So we had uh, seven main muftis of the Sahaba and generally which Sahaba went to which region. So we should, uh, should aim to know this for next lesson, inshallah. And the recordings of the previous sessions are there. So if, um, if you just message me, um, you message me, I'll put my note. Let me just...